coming. Um, my name is Sarah Rip. I'm the undergrad advisor and outreach coordinator for the Latin American Caribbean and Iberian Studies program. And we're really pleased to have you all here today for um, Carolyn's presentation. I don't know if you all um, saw her last film, but we did, she and I collaborated um, our center on a big event a couple of years ago for her other film, which was just spectacular. And so when I heard she did another film she was working on, I was super excited. <laughs> I asked you months ago, I think when I first heard about it, I said, we could bring you in here for a little sneak peek at your next film. So um, yeah, help yourself to coffee and tea and snacks. Yep, yeah, we had some problems with the, with the uh, extension cord. It wasn't working, so everything's under control now. I will turn it over to Alberto. Okay. Well, thanks, thanks, Sarah, and, and welcome, welcome everybody. I'm Alberto Vargas, the associate director of LASIC, the Latin American, Caribbean, and Iberian Studies Program. And I'm delighted to present our speaker today, uh, Carolyn Kallenberg, associate professor at uh, Design Studies here mm -hmm. in Madison. Um, she got her BS and MFA in, mm -hmm. uh, here also in the University of Wisconsin Madison. And she's been working since 2007 here on campus with very interesting projects um, that I really like. A lot of them have to do with, with Mexico. Uh, she presents her work uh, all over the world. And um, right now, she's going to tell us a little bit about her new project. So thank uh -huh. you, Charlie, for yeah. presenting. Great. Uh, Sarah, you want to get the lights? So it's a little dark. I hope you all don't fall asleep, but the colors look better this way. So, um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the project I've been working on. It's actually been going for almost two years that I've been filming, and uh, it will be out this, this October. So it's about Day of the Dead in, in uh, Oaxaca, Mexico. So uh, first of all, I wanted to thank Lassies for their support. Uh, for past projects, especially uh, with Woven Lives, both in having the premiere and in support of the film itself. Um, in January, it was, uh, it was in the Chinese Polytechnic University of Hong Kong where it was shown, at the Environmental Film Festival a couple of weeks ago in Washington, D.C. Uh, that was sponsored by the Textile Museum. It was a really great showing with people that really knew their stuff, so I was glad I did my homework. And then we had the, and, uh, the Mexican film, um, Embassy of uh, Macau just recently called, and they're going to put it as a part of a Mexican film festival there, or Latin American uh, festival there as well. So I really appreciate your help, and the connections with here have made a huge difference with that. There's also, I had the, the exhibition that you also helped, um, helped with as well, so that I could get to Hong Kong in, in uh, January to show. And they really do good graphics there, so I wanted to show that poster. It was rather awesome. So um, this is, and this is what the show looked like there. So I do a lot of work with artisans and making things, but also film and exhibition. And this project here is sort of bringing together a lot of different uh, ways that I work, kind of all in the same thing. So this new project is called uh, La Vida y los Muertos, or Life and the Dead, and it, it addresses uh, the Day of the Dead celebration in Mexico. And I started being interested in, actually in Mexico, my real, in, my drive to really go there and learn about it uh, came from this project that I worked on in Kansas City when I was there on the faculty at the Kansas City Art Institute. We worked with this uh, Latin American cultural center um, each year for Day of the Dead where they had a big celebration where they brought different people in from the communities and they would make altars and people would respond by, um, uh, putting out their own altars and this whole idea of thinking about death and inviting the dead back as sort of a positive thing rather than sort of a very sad thing. We try here we tend to not want to talk about the dead and we just if somebody dies we do what we can to get over it and this is a way that it was a really positive way of interacting with the idea of having lost someone. Uh, these were community altars. Some people were Latino, some people were not. We weren't trying to recreate a, uh, an altar a Mexican altar, they're trying to take the idea of honoring the dead and interpreting it in their own way. So I had students do projects and then also the other community members did that 
And one of the things, and I'll come back to this later, um, that we did my students uh, each year, I think we did this like six years or something, five or six years, and each year the students, we would build this sort of group altar where each person had a section and they would build something in there for themselves. And each year it was quite different and um, there was a lot, some people, someone lost their grandmother in the middle of the project and wound up making the piece about that. Someone else had lost their mother that summer and had like this waterfall with a little battery that run it. But that, that personal expression of, you know, the sense of loss and how you honor this person was really, it was really touching. So it took until, what was it, 2011, till I finally got to Mexico for Day of the Dead. And um, it was an amazing experience. And you know, like any place when you go and travel, you find that your ideas of what you had about it before you went are quite different than after you get there and experience it. It's much more complex, and there's a lot more parts. So one of the things I found is it's quite different what happens in the city and within each village, it's even very different. What happens in this town is not necessarily the same that happens in the, that, in the next town. In the city of Oaxaca itself, which is where I've spent a lot of years with my other research, but again, this was the first time for Day of the Dead I was there, but I've been there for many other parts of the year. But it tends to be, it's quite lively, it's very um, kind of um, almost carnival-like. There's sometimes parades, there's decorations all over the place, whole buildings are full of of paintings and every you know everybody decorates things uh, all crazy and it's really kind of fun much more sort of urban feel to it you'd see different altars this is in a friend of mine's home uh, this one actually you can't tell from the photo but these are like life-size cutouts those are this is huge these are like big cutouts and it's just like I was walking down the street and somebody's got the gates to their sort of entry to their kind of a driveway, so to speak, open, and there's this big thing just sitting there, you know, kind of in a sheltered area. So, and you just see it, stuff all over the place. It's completely sort of spontaneous and unexpected. You don't know where things are going to happen. A lot of people do them in the homes. If you go into the villages, there's a little bit different sense of it. It's still this sense of, of a festival. Um, this is a, a, some friends of mine in their homes. Each, this is both within the same town. But they have a, you know, everybody kind of sets them up their, their own way. But there's certain things that happen the same. They're often in three tiers, like the, um, the earth, or the, the, the subterranean, the earth, and then the heavens. So they're often in three parts. There's almost always food. There's, uh, there's always food. There's always candles. There's always things to drink on there. And then it, but if you go to the cemeteries, this whole other thing happens. And even in the cemetery, one place to the next is quite different. Uh, so like this one is in Mitla, and their dead come at noon, and so they have, and they come in the middle, and they uh, set up, and they clean up the graves, and they walk the, the dead from the cemetery. They um, have, they burn copal, which is sort of what calls the dead. It helps them to know where they're supposed to go. And well, actually, I think they used to walk them. We actually had the copal in the car with us as we drove back to the house. And uh, it tells the dead it's time to come back to the house, and then they have a celebration there. But in like a tsompa, which is like 20 minutes in the other direction outside of Oaxaca, they have their, the dead come around 11 or 12 o'clock at night, and they spend the night in the cemetery with a party. So each place is really quite different. The time of day they come at different is different. In the one before in um, Teotitlan, the dead come at 3 o'clock, not at 11. And I, I don't know why, but that's what happens. <laughs> so, and then there's other towns like, um, oh, this is, oh, this is another one. This is um, ah, San Antonino, and I'll talk about this one quite a bit later. But they really, it's quite, they get the, the graves get very, very decorated, and they, this town grows the flowers, and so the flowers become a really big part um, of, of the decorations that they do. But it's almost, it's almost more like Christmas than it is. It's not like Halloween hardly at all. Um, there's some because you see skeletons and it's about death, but the, the spirit of the whole thing feels much more festive, like it's much more like, like Christmas. And my friend that's from this village, a lot of people have said that they, this is what they looked forward to all year. They couldn't wait. This was the big party of the year, uh, the way that we sort of think about Christmas. They would, that's how they think about Day of the Dead. So it's, it's totally different. People walk around, take pictures. It's not just, there's, there's some tourists in there, but there's a whole lot, especially in the smaller villages, there's much more. This is the people doing these things 
for themselves, for their own families. It's their own celebrations. And they're all walking around with their iPhones and whatever and taking pictures of graves and standing in front of the graves. They decorated very proud. And so it's, it really is like, it feels so much like walking around and looking at people's Christmas trees and you talk to people about them, which is so bizarre when we think about what we tend to do here in cemeteries and how we deal with death. But it's really, it was really beautiful. The other part that really struck me is the sense of time and how long things take to do things. This is a festival only lasts a few days. Um, there's a couple days of preparation and kind of spreads out over about three or four days, but it's called Day of the Dead. And, but the time it takes to prepare is really quite amazing. So this lady's sitting here poking each flower, making a little hole after they first take the grave and kind of smooth it out and poke the hole to set the stem of the flower in place. So each one of these has like, you know, the flower has to get the stem picked off the stem, pop the little hole, and line it up all the way around in order to make the decorations like this. So this is part of a, there's other people, these are sand paintings that are happening. This, is, this one's in the village. This is in the city of Oaxaca. And they take maybe two, three, four days to, to build these giant sand sculptures that are then covered with colored, um, colored uh, chalk and, and other kinds of their seeds and they'll put all kinds of different things in there. And when they're done, they kind of look like this. And they've spent huge amounts of time on things that are probably only gonna last a couple of days. So on this one we saw this year, they were working out for three, four days. It was the, you know, the time for the, like, the inauguration, the big open, opening was like at four o'clock. And at like somewhere around three to four, it started raining. So after they got all the colors in place, that one lady, hey, boy, she's working there. She's exhausted. She's sitting there working on it so much. And it started raining before actually a big crowd ever even got to see it. But there's a sense of that you're doing this. It's about the process of making. It's not about the thing that's being done. And even if you know you're only here for a short time, you put, you put your heart into it and you put something really beautiful into this. And, and it's not about the finished product and how long it's lasts. It's about the process of making and about caring about what you're doing and respecting and, and thinking about the people as you're doing it. So um, this is, I love this quote. This is uh, my friend Allie who says, for some reason, the powerful one allows our loved ones who have died to come back for a day, so we throw them a party. And so I love that whole attitude. I mean, doing that like sums up the whole thing because it can almost feel disrespectful sometimes for the so for coming from a place where we think of death as being a very, you know, being respectful of the dead and not be, not being disrespectful. And not you know, we'll have clips of kids jumping up and down on tombs. And for us, you know, it, it can kind of be kind of jarring. But if you're thinking about it in this with this in mind, it it changes everything that you see. So when the dead come back, they also come back, they're hungry and they're thirsty. The copal helps them to, um, the smell of the copal incense helps them to find their way, the lighted candles and the smell of the, um, the uh, marigolds uh, also helps them to uh, find their way back to their family and to their grave. But you always leave food and water out for them because they're always thirsty and hungry. And there's always food left on the altar. This is the altar of another friend of mine in their home. Um, and there's, you can see there's hot chocolate and pan de los muertos. It's a bread that's made specifically. Lots of fruit, lots of, uh, there's the copal is burning down here and the candles, a few bottles of mezcal thrown around in there. And, um, but they come back hungry and thirsty, but you're, you're kind of honoring them. When people enter the, the homes of, uh, once the hour of the dead has come, when you enter someone's home, you, very, you first go and sort of, um, you greet the altar, you greet the dead people at the altar before you greet the other people in the room. The whole greeting things in the villages is kind of a um, complex process, but it's very much um, a part of it that, that they believe that they're sort of there. So there's also lots of food, so there's both honoring the dead, putting food and music and whatever out for the dead, but there's also honoring each other and the families too. So this is actually, actually my videographer and this is at another, the parents of a friend of mine. This is like at eight o'clock in the morning. There's, <laughs> um, and they, they start, the, the party begins very early and there's just a lot of visiting all day and uh, oh, oh, throughout the 24 hour period, regardless of when the period starts, when the day comes, it's 24 hours that they're present. 
And so there's both plant, you know, uh, hanging out with the dead and there's hanging out with each, each other. This was my breakfast at 8 o'clock that morning. There's a tamale and, there's, and everybody gets these big piles of bread. And um, again, there's beers at, <laughs> at 8 in the morning. So it's, again, it's a big festival that you're having. And um, actually, uh, Michaela, I think you're in that. Oh, no, this is this year. That's Jenny and Sasser in there. That's this year. But you were, Michaela was here with me on the, uh, the filming two years ago. But this is this year. We had a party at, at Tito's house again, but we missed you. <laughs> so, whoops. So this is the clip for the film that gives a, this is the trailer. Okay, so that's to kind of give a feel. That was sort of to give a, trying to give an overall feel of what it is as a whole. But it'll be broken down, the film will be broken down into five chapters. And uh, one is about, each one is about a different place because that was part of what I found was how different each place was from the other. And so I kind of want to tell five very different stories. Also, I want to apologize for the hesitation on that. It has to do with my computer. It's not the filming. The clip was like jumping and it's normally very smooth. So. Anyway, so one of the towns that we're in, a, that um, were, there's, so there's a lot about the altars and in the cemeteries. There's one town that's really quite different from the others. Um, this is uh, San Agustin Etla. And I was, I couldn't figure out why it did this one like costume thing that no one else did. And I found that the story behind that is that there had actually been this um, factory, um, a textile factory in Etla that brought in people from the northern part of the state that had a very different tradition than what happens in this particular part in, in Oaxaca. And uh, so they have this whole sort of uh, dancing with uh, getting all in costume with these wild animals. They dress up like sort of wild animals. And they come from this area that had a lot of uh, sheep herders and and ranches, and so a lot of the figures that they have there come from the ranches, and there's like the boss who's kind of a, you know, like the, the leader who's kind of a nasty character, and they have all these various characters that play out. And they do this really crazy dance. These are little jingle bells that are all over him. So when he stands up and he moves, it's like, you know, as he moves his body, it's really awesome. And then they have like LED lights and, and like, sequin figures of the Virgin of Guadalupe on their back. And it's this crazy mix of you know weird demon things and jingle bells. And it's just nuts. And I really like it. So I'm going to show you a little clip from this town. But it's the only town in the area of Oaxaca that does this for Day of the Dead. So this is the actual sound of the place. It's 
goes on for hours. <laughs> So anyway, so that goes on for like a long time. They get it, and and then they do these parades down the street. And actually, one group. There's three different areas of this that come in, and they all dance in this one, uh, like in the town square. And then they go off and go down the street, and they dance like this until dawn. It's all night long. And then in the, there's another group that comes in, and then they dance, and then they go off and they dance until dawn, going around the streets. And they say that. It's not a good thing if they happen to run into each other, the groups in the streets, because they get to be fights because there's a lot of rivalries and things. <laughs> and they've said things like that, you know, you're all made up and you're somebody else for that night. And so anything goes. And they've said, luckily, they haven't had any major problems. But during that night, it's sort of like you're kind of not responsible for who you are because you've become this other persona for the night. So it's, it's quite interesting what happens there. But it's, a, it's the only place that has that particular, though it's quite different than the rest of the villages around Oaxaca, but totally fascinating. So one of the other ones I would talk about just a little bit is uh, San Antonino, which is known for their um, really fine embroidery that they do all over it. They also grow a lot of the flowers that are um, sold all around the city of Oaxaca. So the, the idea of lots of little flowers is uh, very much a part of their their town's culture. So the images like this come from there. These are all little, um, these are all flower petals off of, it's called a, it's, uh, what's it called, a rooster's, I'm trying to think what it is in English. It's like the, yeah, the rooster's comb or cock's comb. It's a, a kind of a red flower that's kind of fluffy on the top, almost like a little ruffle. And they pull all the little parts off of it and put them around here. And it takes a long time to like, pull each of these flower heads off and move them around. But they're all flowers that are grown there. So one of the really fun things for me, there's several parts of the filming that were particularly like really touching. That last one was like crazy. That was like being in another planet or like in the underworld or something. It's totally nuts. And then, um, but another really beautiful part was, so part of telling the story of this town with the flowers was wanting to be able to tell the story of the flowers themselves. So we start, I started out at dawn out in the flower field where they were, um, this was about three days before uh, November 1st. So they're out cutting and harvesting the flowers and loading them into the truck. And then, so this is that, that rooster, the coxcomb, as it's coming out of the field, they're loading that into the truck. And then you'll see them sold all over the place. There are other places that sell them, but this town does more of the, it's got the right set of water and land and things like that. So it's sold all around the areas uh, of Oaxaca. And there's huge flower fields here. But it was so beautiful. And you have to sit. Like The thing about time came back to me while making it, too, because it's not like you jump in, you take a picture, and you leave. You sit and you wait. You get there an hour before dawn to figure out where you're going to go, talk to people, find out what that's going to be. And you sit and you wait and you wait and you wait and you wait until dawn. And then you wait for a while afterwards to do another shot. So there's that whole sense of like really quieting down and just being present happened during the making of the film as well, which was really beautiful. And then this is the field like right after dawn, which was just uh, gorgeous. So this is like five in the morning or something like that. So in the truck, this is what it was looking like just before it was about loaded up. That's a lot of flowers in that truck. And then they would show up then and, and would see them in other villages being sold too. But these are all the people that were out there working. Um, so this is the sort of things that you'd see in that town, just tons, very, very elaborate um, decorations on the, uh, on the graves, all different flowers. You see a lot of this purple flower in this town that you don't see much in the other flower. It's called the flor inmortal, or like the everlasting flower, because the color lasts for a really, really long time. So you see lots of that in this town that you don't see quite. You see a little bit in the others, but not so much. Um, and then they have this big carnival there. So like you're sitting there in the cemetery, and you have all these you know, um, 
people with their graves and these decorated things. And then there's always music. And the music is like whatever. It's like there's Shakira playing and the tango playing. And there's you know the big brass bands playing. It's all going on at the same time. And outside, there's like this huge carnival with kids jumping around on uh, those giant you know, bouncy things. And then uh, this is like there was a raffle. You could win a cow, or I don't know, was that an oxen <laughs> that they were doing it for uh, 30 pesos. So it was pretty good. So there's food all over the place. So it's this big carnival atmosphere at the cemetery, which is like quite a trip. So one of the parts that was another one that was one of those like just really wonderful moments was that um, the, so some friends of mine, this is Miriam who does embroidery work and I work with her on other things and that's her mother and uh, this is Jenny Angus, my colleague and her son Sasa who were along on the trip. People have been tagging along lately, it's fun. And um, we're decorating the graves for um, Miriam's uh, two grandmothers and so uh, it was, so we, it took a long, it took, took us a couple hours to do it and the amount of time it took to take all these petals off, and then you have to arrange the flowers. Like they're not all even. You have to, you know, where are the big ones and where are the small ones, and how do we put these on? It, it took a lot more time and thought and just presence and attention than I expected it to. But we spent several hours uh, taking, uh, you know, doing these doing these two graves with this whole crew, and you can see our, our finished pieces when we were done. And um, it, it really was one of the, for me, that was one, uh, just one of the most wonderful moments of, of the whole trip to feel like being a little bit part of it. And then Miriam's mother would tell us about her mother-in-law as we're decorating. And she said, oh, she was the greatest mother-in-law. You know, some mother-in-laws are a pain, but she was great, you know. And she's going on and on. And, and uh, you know, and Miriam's helping out with the things, too. So that, that um, kind of the interaction of feeling like being a little bit part of it versus just an onlooker has been a really great um, experience. So um, coming up to all of this and what's happening then is so all these are going to come together. So there's going to, the film will be done in October, actually probably September. And so we're going to do like a whole celebration at uh, Edgewood College. It's, we've been working closely with David Wells, who's the curator of the um, the gallery over there and we actually have a big group of events that's kind of bringing all this stuff together. So um, we have, uh, first of all, there's the, the film premiere will be Saturday.